Hello, Tanya Laird here, and welcome to part four of lecture seven of ENGR 231 Engineering Statics. In this part of the lecture, I just want to work through some basic examples of uh, rigid body equilibria. All right, so let's take a look at this. So rigid body equilibrium examples. So I thought I might work through some basic examples here, uh, looking at how we can apply this uh, to a variety of conditions, objects, etc. So example one. All right, so let's take a look at this. Now I'm gonna in the next in the next lecture I'm gonna get into in detail looking at uh, how. Uh, uh, objects are supported to both pin, roller, and fixed supports. But for now, let's say I have an object that is a, has a fixed support, and uh, it's going to have an interesting geometry. Well, actually, let's start with something very simple. Let's talk about a simple L-shaped bracket. So have, say we have something like this, and a simple L-shaped bracket. Something like this. And let us then say that there is a force of, oh, I don't know, maybe uh, 15 pounds applied at an angle of, oh, 30 degrees. 15 pounds at an angle of 30 degrees. Like so. And I want to give us some dimensions on this. And I'm going to ignore the thickness of the material for now. I'll just say this is, actually this reminds me of, a, it's like a pipe support almost. Uh, let's say this is, oh, I don't know, maybe five feet tall. That would be a bit long for that, but eh, whatever, that's fine. We'll keep it simple for now. And maybe uh, three feet wide, like so. So five feet tall and three feet wide. And uh, this is given, and I'm tasking us with finding, this is given, and then find the reaction forces uh, at the fixed end. Uh, on the fixed end. The reaction forces on the fixed end. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. Now, let's say, so I wanna find the reaction forces on the fixed end. Now, um, for now, I'll, again, I'll save a detailed discussion of reaction forces for the next uh, lecture. But for now, uh, let me just, uh, well, actually, I probably should start by drawing a free body diagram. That is good practice for these. So a fixed support is going to have an X, a Y, and a Z, uh, sorry, an X, Y, a, sorry, a force, a reaction force in the X, a reaction force in the Y, and a moment support, a moment force. So my free body diagram first. Uh, let's see, you know, and let's go ahead and because the dimensions of the object itself aren't important, or the, well, not the dimensions, the thickness of the object itself or the or of this uh, bracket itself is not important. I'm just going to draw it as a line diagram. And then the force on here. I will have a 15 pound force. That is not a 30 degree angle at all. Oh well, not to scale, not to scale, not to scale. So we have a 15 pound force, and this thing is at a 30 degree angle. And I'm just gonna go ahead and call this point A, why not? And the reaction forces, I usually dub them uh, AX, AY, and MA. And MA. So AX, AY, and MA here. And I will also need the dimensions, which I'll just go ahead and illustrate with some brief labels. This will be three feet, and this will be five feet. Now, I do want to go ahead and break these down into components. So I'm going to have a vertical component of 15 uh, times the sine of 30 degrees, and a horizontal component of 15 
times the cosine of 30 degrees. Uh, 15 times the cosine of 30 degrees. And so, uh, and in turn, I can see that it's, this thing's, the vertical component's line of action goes down like this. So the vertical component's line of action will have a three foot moment arm. And the horizontal component, its line of action goes like this, and it'll have a five foot moment arm. But we'll get there. So next, uh, let's start by doing a, let's get the uh, AX and AY. To get the AX, I will simply do a summation of forces in the X direction. And that will be AX plus 15 times the cosine of 30 degrees equals zero. And AX then will be equal to negative uh, 15 cosine 30. We'll just, or just equal to negative 15 cosine 30. And I'm feeling lazy, so let's throw that into my calculator. Mm, negative 15 cosine 30 and I get negative uh, 12.99 uh, pounds. That's going to equal negative 12.99 pounds. Uh, let's see, that works. I'm on my calculator. Uh, let's just, okay, I'll buy that. Negative 12.99 pounds, yes. Negative uh, 12.99 pounds. Okay, then uh, let's do a summation. So we have our first reaction force. That's our first solution there. Summation of forces in the y direction. I will have, oh, and a note on the, on the directions assumed here. I just went ahead and assumed that everything was to the right and positive and upward. And I, I basically, I just assumed all my reactions were positive. I assumed my moment, uh, my MA was counterclockwise, so positive. I assumed AX to the, uh, was to the right and I assumed AY was upward. So then uh, Fy, uh, some, or summation of forces in the y direction, I will have Ay, and then I'm going to do minus 15 times the sine of 30 degrees. Ay, and then minus 15 times the sine of 30 degrees, and all of this must equal zero because we are in static equilibrium. And therefore, Ay is 15 times the sine of 30 degrees, which should come to 7.5. Um, but yes, yeah, 15 times the sine of 30 degrees because I'm feeling very lazy tonight. And of course, 7.5 uh, pounds. Uh, 7.5 pounds. And this would be 7.5 pounds upward and 12.99 pounds to the left. So the net, it's not a problem if we got a negative on our AX. All that means is that the actual force is opposite what we originally assumed. And then I can do a summation of forces or a summation of moments. And this is one's going to be a little bit trickier because we're going to have a few things to contend with. Summation of moments about point A. Notice I use the subscript, uh, summation of moments about point A. And that indicates, so I have the summation, the M for summation of moments, and an A to indicate what point I'm summing moments about. If you're ever summing moments on a rigid body uh, or a free body diagram, you must indicate what point you are summing moments about, because otherwise you're going to have some, uh, again, if I sum moments about this point here, these two forces aren't going to generate any moment there, but these forces will. If I sum moments about here, these forces won't generate a moment about that point, but these will. So uh, we need to consider that. So I'm going to do a summation of moments now. And I think I'll do a uh, about point A, so that's fine. And so let's look at the, uh, first I'll have MA, the reaction moment at A. Then I'm going to have the, I'll look at the X component first. So, and that's going to generate a uh, negative moment about point A. So minus 15 cosine 30 degrees, but then I need its moment arm. And this uh, 15, and again, minus, because it's a cl uh, clockwise moment, which that means it's therefore negative. And its moment arm length is five feet. Times five feet. I should just have some pounds there, pound sign. Uh, then let's consider it's, uh, then I'll have the uh, Y component, the 15 sine 30 degrees, plus 15 times the sine of 30 degrees, times a moment arm length of three feet. And all of this must equal zero, again, because it's in static equilibrium. And so MA therefore, oh, 
uh, actually, sorry about that, that should also be a negative. Uh, the 15 sine 30 degrees is also clockwise, which means it is also negative. And so then, MA, therefore, is going to be equal to 15. Uh, if I just add both these to the other side, that's going to be 15 times the cosine of 15. I'm going to factor out the 15 to make my math a little easier. Times 5 cosine 30 degrees uh, plus 3 sine 30 degrees. And I'm just going to throw that into my calculator. So 15 times the quantity 5 cosine 30 um, plus 3 sine 30. And I get a moment, assuming I math correctly, which uh, you never know. Uh, I get a final moment that is 87.45. Uh, 87.45. And the units for this would be pound feet. Our moment reactions, or a moment, for so long, for a moment, that will always be the end result. Will always be a uh, a, a moment, a, a, a moment. And of course, that's going to have units of force and distance. And that's the basic. Uh, that's the, and that completes example one. So we just have a very simple system, um, a very simple object, and we're just applying basic moment balance to solve it. Okay. So um, let's look at something else. What if I had a system of multiple cables? I like cables. The cables are fun. So let's take a look at this. Example two, a big honking steel beam. So let us consider a big honking steel beam. So imagine I have a large steel beam something kind of like this. Oh, here. Uh, and this thing weighs 10 tons. Big ol' steel beam. And I am told that there are a couple forces, a couple cables holding this up. There is one cable. Uh, let's say a cable here. like this. And let's say this is at an angle of 30 degrees. And there is another cable. And this is at an angle of, oh, uh, let's make this 45 degrees. And then let's say there's another cable off center for some reason, but vertical. And I'll go ahead and give us the dimensions. So a great big 10 ton steel beam uh, supported by some weird arrangement of cables. Something kind of like this here. Uh, let's see, like this. And uh, let's say this is five feet and 10 feet. Like so. All right, and I task us with finding. Uh, let's find. Uh, let's find. So this is given, and I want to find the tension in each cable. The tension in each cable. So we have uh, three ropes, three cables, whatever they may be. Well, actually, ropes would be probably not quite strong enough for big steel beams. So they're, maybe it's their strong steel cables or something up, uh, something like that, holding up this big 10-ton steel beam. And uh, I've hung it this way, and now I want to know what kind of tension is present in each one of the support cables. Okay, and I'm going to neglect the thickness of the uh, beam. Not that it would really matter, but we'll just neglect it anyway. So the first step is going to be to draw a free body diagram. So the free body diagram. And because the thickness doesn't matter, I'm just going to draw the beam as a simple line element. So here's our free body diagram. Oh, that's not a very straight beam. Uh, marginally better. Okay, and I'm gonna draw my forces. I'm just gonna call this one F1 the force on the left at the 30 degree angle, F1, 
uh, F2 for the one in the middle, and F3 for the one on the end. And this is at a 45 degree angle. This one's at a 30 degree angle. And the F2 is vertical. And we have dimensions of 5 and 10. All right, so we could do this any number of ways. We could do this a balance of moments. We could do a balance of forces. Um, unfortunately, there's nothing that we could, that will allow us to directly jump to something. Although, I do have something that allow us to uh, relatively quickly jump to F1 and F3. So in turn, I'm going to call these uh, points 1, point 2, and point 3. So I'm going to do something that allow us to solve a system of two equations first, and then we can solve, uh, instead of trying to solve a system of three equations simultaneously. It's always easier to solve two equations at once rather than three equations. Often you get lucky in that you can uh, go and uh, solve one force directly, and I suppose we could if we wanted to. Let me think about that. Um, oh, actually, I have made a great big mistake. Looking at this, there is something we are missing, and that is the 10 ton force, the weight of the beam. 10 tons, like this. In fact, I'm just going to go ahead and redo my dimensions because of that. Silly me. We have 10 tons, and dimensions on that, well, let's see. It's going to be right in the middle of the beam, and the beam is 15 feet long. Again, assuming it's a uniformly a uniform steel beam, just a constant length, a constant cross section across, this would be 7.5 feet from the left end to the center, from the right end to the centroid. Then we would have uh, 2.5 feet from the uh, cable two to the centroid, and then another, then another uh, that would be another five feet from uh, cable one to cable two. Five feet from cable one to cable two. So five feet, 2.5 feet, and 7.5 feet. Now, let's think about this. Can we, is there a clever way that we could actually uh, do this? Let's think about that. Um, you know, I don't really think, I, there probably is, but I think we, I was thinking about maybe like summing moments about a point down here, and that would allow us to go and directly solve for, uh, or to cancel out the moment caused by F1 and F2, basically looking at where they intersected. But then that's going to be a little bit complicated because we have to deal with breaking F3 into considering both the moments of F3 horizontal and vertical. Uh, it's I don't know if it's quite worth it. So let's just go ahead and do uh, what I was thinking about. So I'm going to start by doing a summation of moments about point 2. I'm going to do a summation of moments about point 2 here. And the x components of F3 and F2, neither of them will generate a moment about point 2. And neither will all of F2. Again, the x component of F3 and F2 both have lines of action passing through point 2, and the entirety of F2 passes through point 2, so we'll, neither of them will generate a moment about there. Now, uh, next, so let's go ahead and get the, uh, okay, the y component of F1 is going to generate a negative moment about point 2, so that's negative, uh, and again, a clockwise or negative moment about point 2, negative F1 times the sine of 30 degrees, times moment arm length of 5 feet. Then F3, uh, F3 will generate a positive moment, um, but that's going to be the F, the, the only the Y component of it. F3 times sine of 45 degrees, times a moment arm length of 10 feet. And then I need to worry about the, uh, I need to worry about the moment caused by the weight of the beam. And that's going to be plus, or actually uh, minus, sorry, because about point two, uh, the weight is generating a clockwise or a negative moment. So minus 10 tons, and 10, I'm not going to convert the tons to kilograms, or not kilograms, to uh, newtons or pounds. I can just leave it as tons. It's a perfectly valid unit of force. Uh, times 2.5 uh, feet, times 2.5 feet. And this must equal zero. So again, let's double check this. Uh, the, the, the y component of F1, negative F1 times the sine of 30 degrees, and again, negative about 0.2 because it's clockwise, with a moment arm length of 5 feet, 
F3. It's a vertical component get by, get by taking the sine of 45 degrees, which is the same cos as the cosine, of course. And it's positive because it's a counterclockwise rotation about 0.2, any moment arm length of 10 feet. And then the weight of the beam, the minus 10 tons, it was a, well, it's going to be a negative moment because it's uh, clockwise, and a moment arm length of 2.5. So I'm just going to go ahead and do this as ugly decimal. So uh, let's get that as the sine of 30. Uh, it's going to be 1 half times 5, of course, so 2.5. So negative 2.5 uh, times F1, and then the sine of 45 degrees, I'm just going to again do this as ugly decimal for now, um, plus 7.071 times F3, and I'm going to bring the 10 times 2.5 over to the right, equals uh, 25 tons equals 25 tons and the feet would just cancel out so I have one equation and I'm gonna then I'm gonna develop another equation that I can then substitute into this so I don't have I can't solve this directly yet but we can relatively quickly with a balance of forces next I'm going to do a summation of forces in the x-direction summation of forces in the x-direction now as far as which of these you do in which order uh, this is one of those things that just comes with experience honestly you have to um, you have to take a look at it and say okay well um, uh, you develop now. You only have the same uh, tools in your toolkit: summation of forces, balance of moments, all of these things. Where you know when some forces, when to balance moments, things like that. As long as you do the math correctly, there are no wrong choices. Really, you can do whatever you want, and if you work through the math, it will still produce the correct answer. But there are some paths that are more efficient than others. And the skill uh, to really get good at this comes with time and practice, like anything else in life. And so, um, you know, uh, as, as I work through some of these, you'll, you may see that I may converge to the solution um, relatively quickly. Um, but, and especially when you're looking at problems in the text or something like that, I may, uh, you may find yourself taking a little bit longer. And really, that just comes with experience. Once you've, once you've done enough of these, you'll start saying, oh, looking at something and say, okay, well, uh, I think the most uh, quickest and most uh, efficient path to the solution is X, or the most efficient path to the, to the uh, answer is Y. Um, but that just comes with experience. So I'm teaching you the basic tools right now, but in terms of actually developing your skills, that's something that comes with practice. So summation of forces in the x direction then, I will have, okay, so the neat thing about this is that F2 and the 10 ton force, both of those are purely vertical. So they will not generate any moment um, or not generate any force in the x direction. So I'll have negative F1 times the cosine of 30 degrees uh, times the cosine of 30 degrees and then uh, plus F3 times the uh, cosine of 45 degrees times the cosine of 45 degrees and this is equal to zero and I can then just go ahead and say that uh, well, let's see F1 is going to be equal to F3 times the cosine of 45 degrees divided by the cosine of 30 degrees which means that F1 is equal to so the cosine of uh, 45 divided by the cosine of 30 if I managed to math that correctly I like using math as a verb uh, <laughs> that's what entertains me I'm easily entertained I guess 0 0.816 uh, times F3 so I now know that F1 is equal to 0 0.816 times F3 which means I can then take this and substitute it into here so negative 2.5 uh, times 0 0.816 F3, oh, if I can get, get from jumping ahead, negative uh, 2.5 times 0.816 F3 plus 7.071 uh, times F3, and this is going to be equal to 25 tons. My pad wants to jump ahead today. This is equal to 25 uh, tons. Okay, so I'm going to multiply this out, and negative 2.5 uh, times 0.816. Um, plus the 7.07 .07. and I get that uh, let's see so negative 2.5 times 0.816 uh, plus that I get 5.03 uh, basically F3 equals 25 uh, equals 25 tons and therefore F3 
is equal to dividing 25 by that, I get that, 20, that F3 is equal to 4.97 tons. Uh, 4.97 tons. And in turn, I can get F1 as well. F1 is equal to 0.816 times F3. So 0 0.816 times 4.97 tons. And uh, times of a point, the 0 0.816 and I get 4.06 uh, tons. So I now have the forces in both F3, in both cable three and cable one. And now getting uh, the force in uh, cable two is going to be relatively simple because all I have to do is a summation of forces in the y direction. So I'm gonna cordon off a little area here and just kinda, I do wanna try to uh, squeeze all of this into one slide. So I'm just gonna kinda cordon off an area here and do it here. So uh, then, a summation of forces in the y direction, this is going to be, uh, let's see, I'll have F1 uh, times the sine of 30 degrees, F1 times the sine of 30 degrees, plus F2, all of it purely vertical, plus F3, uh, my tablet keeps wanting to jump ahead tonight, uh, plus the vertical component of F3, which is F3 times the sine of 45 degrees, and then minus 10 tons. And all of this, of course, equals zero. Okay, so then uh, F2 then, if I solve for this, or solve this for F2, F2 is then equal to 10 tons, uh, minus F1 times the sine of 30 degrees, minus F3 times the sine of 45 degrees. And so F2 then is equal to 10, minus uh, F1, which is the uh, 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 F1, which is the 4.06. So 4.06 times the sine of 30 degrees, and then minus F3, the 4.97, uh, times the sine of 45 degrees. And I'm just gonna throw that into my calculator and let it chug on it. So 10 minus uh, 4.06 times the sine of 30 degrees uh, minus 4.97 times the sine of 45 degrees. And I get a result of 4.46 uh, tons. So 4.46 tons. I'm actually pleased how this turned out. Uh, sometimes, as we've seen in some earlier videos, when you uh, come up with problems on the fly, and I do try to do this on some of these, I like to uh, just sort of make up problems on the fly and kind of just kind of just kind of see how they turn out, uh, for good or for ill, which sometimes works out well and sometimes not so well. And so uh, in this case, it worked out well because uh, sometimes if I didn't plan out the geometry just right, if it didn't end up just right, we could end up with a force that was upward. And while that would make sense mathematically, uh, it wouldn't make sense with how I describe the problem. I describe these as cables, and a cable you can't, by, by definition, you can't push a rope. You can only pull on it. So it wouldn't make sense just to have a negative force in a cable. If I got a negative force, what that would mean is that would be in compression rather than tension, and that wouldn't work. That would work mathematically, but all that would mean, I guess, is that one of the ropes is a uh, rod, a solid rod, and of something like a cable. All right, and that is the basic idea of, um, uh, that's the basic idea of solving that problem. Okay, so maybe one more. Let's think about that. Um, maybe I could do something that is at an angle, perhaps. Hmm. Let's consider this. Um, hmm, what might I do? Um, there's so many different things I could do. Let me think. Um, what about something, oh, I don't know, what if we did something, I'm looking through a few examples I could work through and modify slightly. Okay, oh, this is a good one. What happens if I have something kind of like this? Uh, let's say I have an, a simple object resting at an angle. Consider this for a moment. Let's say I have a simple object uh, resting at an angle. And, so I have something like this. Uh, 
And let's say this is a 45 degree angle. And maybe I have a stop here preventing the object from uh, moving. And so this is like basically a surface here. No, I don't want to go through the surface. So I have a surface here. And I just have a bar of some sort of smooth bar. Um, maybe I can draw it in maroon. Just a smooth bar resting here and here. Something like that. And uh, let's say, uh, okay, so this is a smooth bar. Let's say it's, oh, I don't know, 10 feet long. All sorts of pretty colors tonight. 10 feet long and has a mass of, or maybe a weight of uh, five pounds five pounds here. This thing has a mass, or a weight, I should say, of five pounds. Now, what I want to do, oh, and this is also at, let's say, oh, um, let's put this at a 60 degree angle. 60 degree angle. So definitely not the scale. Okay, so that makes sense. Uh, let me think. Yeah, that would still... Um, let me think, would that intersect? Yes, that still, that still will intersect. Yes, that's going to be just fine. Okay, so not too bad, definitely not to scale, but it's uh, it'll be just fine, because if I have a 60 degree triangle and a 45, well, actually, no, uh, that's going to be a problem, isn't it? Um, hmm. Let's say this one instead is, let's say, a 30 degree angle. That will actually be possible. We need these things to actually intersect, otherwise we're going to have all sorts of problems. So we have a 30 degree angle and a 45 degree angle. Now, so let's go ahead and solve this. And we have a smooth bar here. And what I want to do is I want to find uh, the reaction forces or the forces uh, holding the bar up on its ends. Now, this bar is basically resting on this surface, and it's, a, it's resting against this support here, and it's resting on this surface here. So basically, this thing is being held up by three normal forces. So we're going to have to play with the trigonometry a little bit, which is always fun. And I'm going to draw this as a line element. So we have, I'm going to call this point A and point B. Now. Let's think about this. Let's see. I have uh, this here. I have. I'm going to have the normal force on the horizontal surface. I'm just going to call an AX, or sorry, an AY. And the normal force against the horizontal surface here is going to be an A. Uh, is going to be an AX here. Now, this normal force here. There's going to be a normal force, and it's going to be perpendicular to this surface, and that's going to be basically at a 45 degree angle. So it's going to be uh, 45 degrees from the horizontal. And I'm just going to call that FB, or just B. Why not just B? And that will be at a 45 degree angle. Now, if this were not a, now at the 45 degree, um, that actually makes things very simple because we don't have to think about the trigonometry, but, um, well, if sine or cosine doesn't matter, but if we were doing this, if it were not, then we'd actually have to consider the uh, work through the trigonometry. And if you remember back to, uh, if you need a hint on that, if you remember back to, uh, you know, basic physics, when you have a weight on a slope, the gravity is like uh, the sine of the angle, etc. But really, this isn't going to be too bad. You can just work through the trigonometry, play through the angles. It's not going to be terribly difficult. And we have a uh, dimension of 10 feet. And we are going to have one other force. And we have a 10 foot long thing, a 10 foot long bar, and we have a third force. And that third force is going to be at the center the centroid, and that's going to be uh, five pounds. Again, weight always acts through the centroid of the bar, or through the center of mass of the object. And another angle that we'll need, we'll need the angle of the bar that should be shown on the on the free body diagram. 
and that's 30 degrees. Okay, so let's uh, start working on this. And I'm gonna start by, okay, let, let's think about this. Um, this is gonna be, the B is gonna have both an X and Y component. I wanna break that up because we're gonna need to do that when we do sum of forces and balance of moments. I'm gonna start by doing that. I'm gonna have a B times the uh, sine of 45 degrees, which of course will be the same as the cosine, and a B times the cosine of 45 degrees. B sine of 45 degrees and B cosine 45 degrees. Next, uh, I'm gonna start by doing a balance of moments about point A. Let's do a summation of moments about point A and the reason I did that was because AX and AY both will generate, not, neither will generate any moment about point A. And so let's go, so then uh, the five pound force will generate a negative moment because it's clockwise about point A. So that's negative five pounds. Now the moment arm length is gonna be, actually let me do this maybe uh, somewhere that'll give me a little more room. Uh, I'm gonna start here, I guess. Sorry about that. Uh, summation of moments about point A I will have a uh, negative five pounds, a uh, negative five pounds times uh, a moment arm length now. And the moment arm length is going to be the horizontal distance from here to here. And the distance, the hypotenuse distance is five feet uh, from here to here. So that means the moment arm length is just the X component of that, which is five feet times the cosine of 30 degrees. Five feet times the cosine of 30 degrees. Then I need the uh, moment caused by the vertical component of this. So let's do uh, B, the force B, times uh, its moment arm length is going to be the uh, full hypot the full uh, leg of the triangle, which is uh, 10 times the cosine of 30 degrees. 10 times the cosine of 30 degrees. And again, this is positive because that vertical, that B, that force B is, uh, is gonna be rotating uh, counterclockwise about point A. So it's a, clockwise, it's a counterclockwise or positive moment. And then uh, the, for the horizontal component, plus, oh, actually I made a big mistake. I don't need the full force. I need the vertical component, which is B times the sine of 45 degrees. Sorry about that. And then it's moment arm length, which is the same as 10 foot times the cosine of 30 degrees. Then, I need the horizontal component, which is B times the cosine of 45 degrees. But again, in this case, the horizontal and vertical are the same. Uh, B times the cosine of 45 degrees. And now we have a uh, moment arm length of 10 times the sine of 30 degrees. 10 foot times the sine of 30 degrees. And all of this is equal to zero because uh, this is statics class and everything is gonna be in static equilibrium. And so uh, then uh, let me multiply five, uh, or just 25 times the cosine of 30 degrees. Uh, let's see, so I have B times, let's just, uh, I'll just go ahead and do, um, do this in pieces. This is, every, everything in this term comes to 21.65, 21.65 uh, 21 plus B times uh, sine 45, times 10 times the cosine of 30 degrees. And I get uh, 6.123 or 124. 6.124 and then cosine of 45 degrees times 10 times the sine of 30 degrees. Uh, cosine 45 degrees times 10 times the sine of 30 degrees. And uh, I get uh, 3.54 or 3.536 times b is equal to zero. And then bring this together uh, and put it, moving the 21 to the other side, uh, adding that and dividing, I get that b uh, is equal to uh, 2.24. That leads us to that b is equal to 2.24 pounds. Uh, 2.24 pounds. Okay, so we have that force. 
Uh, and then the rest is going to be fairly straightforward. I can do a summation of forces in the x direction. I should be able to squeeze this onto this slide. The summation of forces in the x direction. Well, uh, I will have ax, uh, ax, and then uh, I'm going to have just the x component of b. So minus b times the cosine of 45 degrees, and all of this is equal to zero. And so ax then is equal to 2.24 times the cosine of 45 degrees. And this is then equal to uh, times the cosine of 45 degrees. And I get 1.58 uh, pounds. 1.58 pounds. And then finally, a summation of forces in the y direction. Uh, summation of forces in the y direction, I will have uh, ay minus 5 and then plus b times the cosine or times the sine of 45 degrees is equal to 0. And so ay then is equal to 5 minus b sine 45, which is equal to 5 minus uh, 2.24 times the sine of 45 degrees. Uh, 5 minus 2.24 times the sine of 45 degrees. And I, if I math that correctly, I get uh, 3.42 pounds. Assuming, I, again, I math that correctly. And I did like, and I do like using math as a verb. Anyway, th that's the basic idea. So um, we see that these are three very different problems, three relatively different problems, one with, one with just a fixed support, one with a, a couple tension supports, uh, and then one with just a couple uh, forces, a couple normal forces holding it up. And really, though, we can see that we're following the same basic method for all of these. When we're doing basic rigid body equilibria, we are first looking at what kind of forces are applied to it, what kind of forces are holding it up. Then we're using some combination of balance of moments, we're using some combination of balance of forces, and we're solving for whatever unknowns are desired. And these can be quite elaborate and quite involved, but even the most advanced problems of this form are all going to follow the same basic method. And for 2D systems, basically you have three equations of equilibrium. For 2D systems, again, you have three equations of equilibrium you can use. Uh, you can use one, summation of forces in the x direction, two, uh, summation of forces in the y direction, and three, uh, balance of moments, summation of moments about some point. Now, I would like to mention that you can do these problems using only balance of moments often. So what I, I chose to be a little lazy and just do balance of forces at this point, but, but what I could have done is, um, once I'd gotten B, I could have gone and used another balance of moments here, and I could have said, okay, well, I already know B, and so I could, I could say, okay, well, I'm going to take moments about this point here, where they intersect, for example, and uh, so I could have done that, and that would have worked out just fine. Um, or I could have done, and, and that would have, that, what that would have done is the AX would not generate a moment about there, and the B vertical component wouldn't, uh, wouldn't either, and I, could, I would have basically only one unknown there, just the AY. Then what I could have done also uh, to get AY then, I could have some moments, if I, and to, sorry, that would give me AY, then to get AX, I could have some moments about this point here where ay will not generate any moment and ax will and i could have some moments so i could have done this entire problem without doing a single balance of forces however though so you you can choose which ones of these you use and actually if you're being very clever often what i'm doing if i'm not feeling so lazy is that i actually go and uh solve an entire problem using only balance of moments and the nice thing about that saving using only balance of moments is that you can then use your horizontal and vertical forces as a check on your math so if I were feeling a little bit more motivated and this video wasn't long enough, I could do this problem using a balance of moments and then just use the balance of forces as a check on your math. And that's very good on exams especially because you're a, uh, it's a good way to check your math as you're working through an exam problem, a good uh, old school uh, trick on uh, statics exams. So you can use, so I say you have 2D systems, I say for 2D systems you have three equations of equilibrium, but really you can use uh, any three of these. You can use, well, you can't use sum of forces X and Y more than once, but you can use moments repeated, uh, use that repeatedly just by taking balance of moments at multiple points. However, this can be a little bit deceiving. Don't trick yourself. Now, 
There is no such thing as a free lunch. No free lunch. And what do I mean by that? Well, in this context, what I mean by that is that um, you will always have three equations of equilibrium. It doesn't matter what kind of... Now, you can set up balance of moments for however many number of points you want, but you can only solve for three unknowns. Just the way the math works, you'll only ever be able to solve for three unknowns, um, with and only three unknowns, uh, on a single rigid body. Now, if you have if you have uh, objects with joints in them, then, then it becomes actually two objects rather than one. Or if you have like ropes and things like that, and, and different objects joined together with pulleys and that kind of thing, well, then it becomes a bit more complex. But a single object, a single rigid body, you're only ever going to be able to solve for three unknowns upon that. So, if this were, uh, if I had a fixed support here and then a uh, a flat surface here, well, in that case, I'd have three. I would have total. I have three unknowns here and another unknown here, and I would have four unknowns. And that problem would then become statically indeterminate. I couldn't solve for it using the laws of statics alone. And so, um, you can pick whatever balance of. You can pick whatever combination of summation of forces, of balance of moments, and whatever number of uh, whatever uh, points you wish, whichever are convenient. But no matter how clever you are, if it's a single object, you're not going to be able to solve for the unknown forces if there are more than four using the laws of statics alone. In order to do that, you need to, need to look at things from mechanics and materials, structural analysis, and high-level courses where you start considering what the thing is actually made of, how much it deflects, that sort of thing. Anyway, I think that'll do it for now. I think that'll conclude uh, Lecture 7 here. Uh, in Lecture 7, again, in Part 1, we looked at some basic uh, theory of... Uh, the equations of rigid body equilibrium. In part two, we discussed um, free body diagrams and some other related things. And then in part three, we discussed uh, in part three we discussed a, our um, a two body and three body support condition. And finally, in part four, we have now looked at the uh, a few long form examples uh, of uh, rigid body equilibrium. Actually, working at some problems with numbers. All right, so I think, actually, sorry, no, in part two, we didn't discuss free body diagrams. That was the previous lecture, we, or previous lecture two. In part two, we looked at uh, why it is, it is important in using, uh, important to use the rigid body assumption in statics. Sorry about that. Part two, we looked at why we use the rigid body assumption. And in part four, four now, we've looked at some examples of uh, rigid body, uh, simple rigid body equilibrium problems. And then in part, I think in the next lecture, lecture eight, we are going to begin to explore uh, some of the, um, some of support conditions, looking at pin supports, roller supports, and how could those can be applied to more complex uh, rigid body uh, problems. And that will finish up our discussion before we start looking at trusses in the next lecture, in lecture uh, nine, I suppose. Okay. All right. That'll do it for now. Please let me know if you have any questions. That will, that will, this will uh, end lecture seven. I hope you found this enjoyable. Hope you found this a little bit illuminating, enlightening, etc., etc. And if nothing else, hopefully not too boring or hopefully you've at least learned something. So again, please let me know if you have any questions. Uh, feel free to contact me at my uh, class email or here at YouTube. That, that works too if you're not one of my students. Uh, and I'll maybe be able to answer questions in time. So again, uh, please let me know if you have any questions. Hope you all enjoyed this. Uh, and so again, Tanya Laird signing off. And as always, thank you.